it is my desire that the word we intake this month becomes alive within us, also heading into the summer months. So Acts Alive is the name of the track, and we are going to kind of dive in and re-examine the first four chapters of Acts. Based on where we are in the year and where we are as a group, I believe the Lord is leading us back to early church territory. I know for some of you, this content might sound a little familiar. If you were here in 2014, I think most of you were not. However, in light of this year's school narrative, the school year's narrative and the new emerging youth core, which encompasses a lot of you, I believe the Lord wants to minister a purifying work in this group in the months ahead. And one of the best ways he does that is through the unity of the saints. And Acts 1 through 4 is basically your poster chapter section of the Bible as far as unity of the saints. So with that said, let's take an aerial look in the first few chapters, again, Acts 1 through 4, before we split up into small groups. All right, so follow along. Acts 1, Jesus ascends into heaven. Um, Immediately disciples are without the physical presence of the man they've been following for three years of intense ministry. Yet after the disciples return from the Mount of Olives, note where we find them, back in the upper room, devoted in prayer. So it's interesting how right away we see evidence of Jesus having paved the way for his disciples to know truth and live with real faith. The disciples weren't praying with the mindset of, oh yeah, this is the happening thing to do. No, they did it because they loved Jesus. They wanted to be faithful to the example he had set for them because they believed the promise of the Holy Spirit, what the day of Pentecost is all about in Acts 2, and because they wanted faith to trailblaze their future. When we continue in Acts 2, we see unity coming into greater clarity through Koinonia. Now, how many of you, I say Koinonia, and you're like, what in the world is that? Cornucopia. There you go. Cornucopia. Hunger Games? Quinoa. Yeah. Quinoa, yeah. That's a good one. Actually, I haven't thought of that. Quinoa, Koinonia. It sounds fun. It sounds like a cool word, but what is it? I'll let the word define. So uh, let's go to our Acts 2, 42 slide. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the communion, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Sounds pretty cool, huh? So here's the key takeaway. The disciples believed in what they knew to be true and they lived it out, plain and simple. They didn't care what was mainstream at the time. They cared what was real and what Jesus had made real to them. And so what's so powerful about Acts 2 is you have people from all over the map joining together at a time when past prophecy was intersecting a new reality coming into place, the Holy Spirit coming as Jesus promised. It's one of the most glorious chapters in the entire Bible with respect to community and worship. So let's continue. Uh, Acts 3 is important, uh, but we're going to go into Acts 4 here. Starting in verse 23, should be another slide for this. Um, We find the early church praying for boldness, seeing the scriptures, seeing the prayer, meditating in scripture, early church praying vocally together, and the result is at least twofold as they not only reap favor among themselves, but among the people they're aiming to reach. Now, as we read on later in Acts, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have had some type of exposure to Acts. We find trials and tribulations do come. Not everything is rosy and peachy keen. However, because the early church was established in Koinonia, because they saw their circumstances in light of God's word, they were able to recognize that the wrath of man never operated outside the sphere of God's control. So as a result, they lived in harmony and in peace with one another, knowing that whatever came their way, God had his hand on them first. He was paving a way for them. Moving on into Acts 4, 29 through 30, we again see early church disciples Asking for more boldness, more power, and essentially more trouble. For those of you who are like, huh? Doing a double take to that, let me explain what I mean by more trouble. Whenever unity in early church community intersected boldness, all of a sudden, everything that was said and done was consumed for God's glory, or consumed for God's cause with God's glory. Make sense? Thus, they were able to increase both their faithfulness as a local church body and their fearlessness outside of it. That, to me, just inspires me when I think about how the early church approached community, i.e. Koinonia. No question, 
the early church faced many confrontations and challenges. However, because they stayed strong through the ups and downs, the persecutions, because their unity and effort did not waver, they were able to accomplish the vision God had placed in their hearts. However, boldness was not the only fruit of their unity. If we dig deeper into Acts 4, we note how the early church did not ask to do miracles. Why is that? Why not ask to do miracles? Because they understood, though Jesus had the power to heal, they had been given the authority to access and encounter that power and extend it in his name. On the mission field, they had accessed that power through faith, but in their togetherness, their community, their koinonia, they accessed that power through delight, specifically in God and his ways. And I think that's really important. That's super powerful to me that, that I can encounter God's power simply by delighting in the scriptures, seeing the scripture, seeing the prayer. So it's important we understand first century disciple makers not only increased in their fearlessness, but also in their humility as they matured in their oneness. So while I could go on, I want to pause here and let this commentary serve as the foundation for where we go the next three Sundays and also the small group discussions that we're about to partake in.